you've got to explain more about that because I'm not sure if I can understand exactly what it looks like. So, so the whole switch or the ASIC the or everything? Switch, the GPUs, everything is inside of a container of liquid. And so you need to have great technology uh, specifically, and obviously not only the, the GPUs, but also when you start to plug interfaces in, and this is where our leadership position in silver photonics has really helped us out. I mean, the pushback I'm always getting about AI is the privacy thing, and that's what I asked you earlier. So it's companies want to run AI, want to use all the advantages of AI, but obviously want to keep the data private. Is that the, the one of the big goals, right? That's a, a huge part. And it could be for, for regulatory reasons, or compliance reasons, yep. or it could be for religious reasons, right? They, yep. just, just want, they just want it that way. Yep. Different use case. So the 800 gig is inside of the data center. Okay. Uh, and then outside of the data center, these data centers are large. You want to be able to connect them together with the highest speed capacity yep. possible. And this is where we've been pushing the envelope. So 1.2 terabits per second per wavelength. It's hard for the for the mind to, to comprehend it. So it's on amazing. a link, how much, what's, what's the total bandwidth that I'm going to get? Well, how many wavelengths do you have? Yep. Right? You tell me how many wavelengths you have and I'll tell you how fast it'll go. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble coming to you from Cisco Live, back with Jonathan. Jonathan, great to see you again. It's absolutely great to be back here. Last time we spoke, you announced NVIDIA Cisco doing something, but I believe there's deliverables now, big changes. And well, we, we just announced the Cisco Nexus Hyperfabric, okay. which is a combination of, of course, NVIDIA GPUs, their smart NICs, our Nexus 800 gig switching, uh, and then a wonderful wrapper of cloud-based management. So it's an enterprise AI data center that is gonna be managed from the cloud. So the company that has brought you all cloud management for your campus and your branch is now doing the same thing for the data center. Why is that light on in your glasses? Um, I just wanna be more bright. Uh, no, this, this is, these are the new uh, Meta Ray-Ban glasses and it actually is recording us. These are the new Meta Ray-Ban glasses and so I can make a recording with them and it actually looks pretty good. I think like them a lot, you can take pictures and videos. So you've just delivered the keynote, but perhaps a lot of people who are watching haven't seen that. So perhaps you can give us like the behind the scenes or like the informal version of what was announced. Happy to. So really we talked about three major things yep. today. So the first one is how we're helping all enterprises around the world deliver digital resilience to their companies, yep. their organizations, their businesses. And we're doing that with digital experience assurance. Okay. There's this concept of owned and unowned infrastructure. Obviously you own it, means it's your campus, it's your branch, yep. Yep. it's your data center. You don't own it, it's the service provider network, it's the yep. cloud. Yep. We see everything okay. with 650 billion points of events of data coming to us, 5 billion synthetic transactions every single day. We know what's going on across what we call now the global area network. Okay. So we wanna make sure that we can deliver digital resiliency to all of them, that's number one. Okay. Number two, we announced Cisco Nexus Hyperfabric. Okay. And this is our partnership with uh, NVIDIA. Yep. So NVIDIA GPUs, NVIDIA SmartNICs, Cisco 800 gig data center switches, and then this wonderful cloud orchestration to manage your on-prem or edge AI deployment. So that's the second big thing. And the third thing that we're really excited about. So a year ago, we launched Cisco Networking Cloud Platform. Yep. Well, we've done a lot in a year. And so I wanted to tell people how we are, you can now manage your Catalyst switches. You can manage your Catalyst wireless. You can also have uh, both Meraki SD-WAN as well as Catalyst SD-WAN is now a common fabric. Yep. And you can manage those wired and wireless all with the Meraki dashboard. So that's really exciting. And then we just announced Cisco Workflows, which enables you to manage across multiple domains, your campus, your data center, your branch, and more and it gives you really simple ways, drag and drop, to automate all the simple tasks across your infrastructure. So amazing pace of innovation from the team. I'm really proud of them. Yeah, it's great to see because uh, I think some people, there's some criticism to, about Cisco, the innovation has slowed down, but it's, it's, that, it's picked up a lot recently. I think this is our biggest a number of things that we have to yeah. launch in probably five years. That's great. Okay, audience from our last video, one criticism was, okay, digital experience, privacy. Right. Well, so there's two things to that. So yep. one, and this is why it's so great that we've now completed the acquisition yep. of Splunk. Yep. So all your private data is yep. going to go into Splunk, whether you want to keep it on-prem or whether you want to keep okay. it in the cloud. But what we want to be able to do is take 
our data. Yeah. So we have a bunch of anonymized data. We're doing those, those synthetic transactions. Yep. We're seeing events that we've anonymized. And we're able to then get a state of what's happening across the global yep. area network. Our goal is to correlate that data and share that telemetry stream with your data inside of Splunk. We're yep. not quite there yet, yep. but that's the intent and that's the goal where we want to get to. So give us more information about the NVIDIA Cisco partnership. Yeah. Well, it is a deep technical engineering level engagement. Okay. We then just throw something together. And uh, I like to think of like any other tools that you might have are really toys, right? This is really deep infrastructure. Three out of the four hyperscalers around the world yep. are utilizing Cisco's Ethernet in their backend infrastructure. Wow. And so our goal, obviously a lot of this is with NVIDIA, our yep. goal is to go and take everything that we've learned, distill it down, simplify it, yep. And, and take it into the enterprise. And I'll give you an example. Yep. Cabling can be a challenge when you're building these networks. Yep. And so we wanted to say, all right, if I'm an installer, I have an application on my phone, if I plug in the wrong cable to the wrong port, it might take me a while to figure it out. With this app, it will tell you immediately, okay. hey, this is in port two, it's supposed to be in port three, why don't yep. you move it over one? So we really wanted to simplify the deployment of these things, and that's just one really simple example about how we're getting there. Is it 800 gig that I heard correctly? It is 800 gig. That's great. Yeah, so obviously we're excited about that on the data center. Outside of the data center, not that many people know if you're not in the optical space, but we've got a 1.2 terabits per second per wavelength, wow. which is a, this is an amazing outcome. So you have these AI data centers and yep. the hyperscalers. They've got to connect them. You need yep. more and more capacity. And so we're pushing the envelope in optics and optical uh, as well as inside the data center. Because there's new QF, uh, SFPs, is that right? Uh, there are, there's always new. So yep. we, we do OSFP, we do QSFP, uh, we have ZR, ZR Plus, Bright ZR. There's lots of ways that we're doing it. That's all at 400 gig going to 800 gig. And this one is a SIM 8 module, is what we call it, C-I-M-8. And you can slide it in. So it's the first pluggable 1.2 terabit per second. So I, I heard 800 gig, but you're talking faster than that. Is it, is it, is it a different use case or? Different use case. So the 800 gig is inside of the data center. Okay. Uh, and then outside of the data center, these data centers are large. You want to be able to connect them together with the highest speed capacity yep. possible. And this is where we've been pushing the envelope. So 1.2 terabits per second per wavelength. It's hard for the for the mind to, to comprehend it. So it's on amazing. a link, how much, what's, what's the total bandwidth that I'm going to get? Well, how many wavelengths do you have? Yep. Right. You tell me how many wavelengths you have, and I'll tell you how fast it'll go. So the, that, I mean, that's amazing. The the data centers that we're talking about is this for the hyperscalers, or is this for enterprises? This between data centers, this is mostly the hyperscalers because the size of these clusters is getting beyond a single physical structure. Even though they might be right buildings right next door, you need to be able to connect those buildings next door to each other, and you want to do that in the highest speed capacity possible. Is hyperfabric for the um, the hyperscalers, or is that for enterprises or both? Hyperfabric is for the enterprises okay. specifically. So the hyperscalers, they build their own automation stacks. Yep. Uh, they may even have their own network operating systems. Yep. So we deliver them things from silicon only, gray boxes. So that yep. means we deliver them a system with no software. Yep. We deal them a fully integrated system. We deliver them actually even components of optics and they build their own optics. Yep. So we deliver them usually pieces. Okay. Um, but that's really complicated for yep. an enterprise. And so yep. we want to be able to do is build a system, a data center system, for these enterprises. And that includes everything you need, GPUs, smart NICs, the compute, uh, as well as those 800 gig network switches, the cloud management, as well as there's a lot of software coming out of NVIDIA for like NVAI Enterprise. This is what they have, they have done. Uh, and also we've been partnering with Vast Storage uh, as, a, as a really big, great way to connect and make sure all of this works together seamlessly. So Hyperfabric will actually go down and manage the SmartNIC for oh, wow. you. It will manage the connection into okay. that storage infrastructure. So the idea is that enterprises get their own AI data centers. Is, did I understand that right? If you want to keep your data on premise, yep. you need your own data center. And, and a lot of we, we, what we're hearing from enterprises is they want to push the simple button to keep their data on prem and to go and manage this. Simple, it's the same thing we've seen with cloud everywhere. Yeah. There are workloads that make more sense on-prem and there are workloads that make more sense in the cloud. So we see people going and starting to go down their AI journey in the cloud and for cost reasons or for privacy reasons, they're moving those workloads or they're going to scale on-prem. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I mean, the pushback I'm always getting about AI is the privacy thing. That's why I asked you earlier. So it's companies want to, want to run AI, want to use all the advantages of AI, but obviously want to keep the data private. Right. Is that the... the 
one of the big goals, right? That's a, a huge part. And it could be for, for regulatory reasons or compliance reasons, yep. or it could be for religious reasons, right? They, yep. they, just, just want, they just want it that way. Yep. And so we've seen the whole spectrum of the reasons for it. And our job is, you know, we don't really need to know the reason why you want to keep it on-prem, but if you want to keep it on-prem, we believe that we are the best partner to enable you to do that. Last time we spoke about Infinibad, that's been, been replaced with Ethernet in the data centers? And we believe in the enterprise data center. So yep. I'll, 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 I'll take a step back. Yep. So those hyperscalers, three out of the four leading hyperscalers, AI backend using our Ethernet yep. technology. And the hyperscalers have been really clear on the fact that they want to be able to have a, an open connectivity options for their backend AI infrastructure. So that's happening. Yep. Enterprises, they want to have very similar things. They know Ethernet, they understand yep. Ethernet, they've been deploying yep. it. What we need to do is make sure that it can give them the scale that they need, yep. the resiliency that they need, uh, and, and of course, the simplicity that they've come to expect from, from Ethernet. And we know we can deliver to them. We've been doing this for quite some time. AI and didn't just pop out of nowhere. You know, we've been selling GPUs as part of our compute systems for over a decade now. Yep. So now we want to do is we really want to make it even easier for people to be able to go and do that. So, I mean, the idea of the fabric is that it's not, you're not just managing the network infrastructure, you're managing the servers, all of that in, in one go, is that right? Okay. All from a single console. And that's the simplicity angle. Um, the one thing we're not doing, we're not managing the jobs. Like you still have to go and, <laughs> yeah. and, and do your own AI yep. jobs and how you want to go and get your, your, your task completion time and all those kinds of things. We're not managing that part, but all the infrastructure. So if you're an IT specialist or data center specialist and you've said, hey, I need you to go build me out an AI cluster next week, like we, we, we can help you out. You've said, I think you, last time we spoke, you said something about you cannot have AI without the network. Absolutely. So can you explain that in like, just for people who haven't heard that before, what that means? Sure, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that um, my, uh, my head of engineering came up with, and he said, in a, if you just take a single rack yep. of GPUs, yep. that single rack of GPUs is, has more bandwidth in it than the entire North American mobile cellular infrastructure. So think about that and think about how much bandwidth that needs for multiple racks or yep. multiple pods or multiple clusters of capacity. You've, the network is critically important. And that's from the data center infrastructure. But I think there's a second part to your question, which is as we see this AI wave of yep. technology going from the hyperscalers, enterprise data centers, out towards users, consumers, out towards the edge, retail branches, the connectivity becomes more important. Yeah. Are you going to do inferencing in every retail branch in every quick serve fast food restaurant? Or are you going to want to be able to do that close in yeah. the edge? So that connectivity is important. So today, if I lose my, my connection and I can't swipe a credit card, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. But if I have all of my kiosks are AI powered and inferencing is done one hop back into the carrier network and I lose my connectivity, my entire business is shut down. So this is why I think this wave of AI that starts in the hyperscalers, it goes into enterprises, and then it goes all the way out very far to the edge. These large data centers, I'm assuming, use like tremendous amounts of power. Yeah. So is there any way to like optimize that or do it better? Yeah, well, that's, that's a big challenge. Yep. You know, in fact, a lot of uh, data centers today are, are power constrained yep. more than anything. And so anything we can do to lower the overall power, this is what we've been working on fundamental technologies yep. with Silicon One to lower the amount of power per 100 gig, 400 gig, 800 gig port. Um, but also uh, we're leaders in silicon, silicon photonics okay. uh, with our optics. And we actually have been leading the way around immersion technologies for your optics. So normally you want to keep water or other liquids away from all of your, you know, your devices. But in this case, you're actually submerging them and using a Cisco optic to plug in it within a liquid. So it kind of blows your mind up a little bit to think about it, but that's the future because it dramatically reduces the PUE for a given data center. Okay, you got to explain more about that because what I, when you said that, I'm thinking about like water-cooled PCs, that's the thing these days. Right, but you're actually submersing the entire PC into the water. You're not actually oh, wow. running water over the chip. The entire device is submerged in liquid. You've got to explain more about that because I'm not sure if I can understand exactly what it looks like. So, so the whole switch or the ASIC the or switch, everything? The GPUs, everything is inside of a container of liquid. And so you need to have great technology 
uh, specifically, and obviously not only that the GPUs, but also when you start to plug interfaces in, and this is where our leadership position in silver photonics has really helped us out. There's a lot of talk about AI. I believe Cisco are investing not just within Cisco, but outside Cisco, is that correct? Yeah, well, we have a huge investment inside the company with yep. our, our R&D budget. But we also believe it's, it's part of our responsibility to make sure that we're innovating across the industry. Yep. And so we just announced our $1 billion AI investment fund, and $200 billion of it has already been allocated yep. to a number of companies. So companies like Mistral, Cohere, and Scale AI. So these are, are they, these are like startups or other businesses that you're investing into like drive AI, is that correct? So they could be very small companies yep. or in the case of Scale AI, they could be pretty large companies. Yep. Uh, so we feel like it's important to make sure that either we can understand exactly or help maybe prioritize um, specific investments for that they're making, but also it's important for us to really move the industry forward. And it, this ties back to other investments that we're making around um, quantum computing and things of that nature, because it's impactful not only to AI, but it's impactful to security as well. So we've covered quite a bit about the Cisco NVIDIA partnership, and it was great to see, like we spoke only a few months ago, where you, you announced it and now already there's product being delivered, but you also mentioned digital resilience. Can you talk more about that? Well, first, I think it's important to know what digital resilience is. So yeah. in our, our business lives and yeah. our personal lives, we are dependent upon the internet, your own infrastructure, your yeah. unknown infrastructure, and what we're calling the global area network, as I mentioned. Yeah. What we want to be able to do is understand everyone's digital experience and be able to tell businesses in real time what's happening, why it's happening, and how they could remediate or automatically remediate. So you can go from a four-hour outage to a four-minute minor disruption. Wow. And, and that's the power of data, and that's the power of what we're doing with digital experience assurance. And putting these uh, agents we, uh, around the world, we call them vantage points, has really given us a significant amount of data. And every time one of those vantage points is deployed, we get another 5,000 points of data every single day. Wow. And there's millions of these things that are deployed and we're seeing the deployment of them going up uh, every single day. So in other words, it's, it gives you a lot of visibility in, into what's happening and you can predict issues much more easily? Um, we can not only predict, we can see them. So yep. I can tell you, if you are a, or just over the last few weeks, we've gone and looked at uh, a whole view of uh, different um, banking companies. And we know what services they're using, how many of them are using Salesforce, how many of them are, are using SharePoint. And we can also know that nine of them were impacted by a CRM outage uh, last week, which lasted four hours. This is the kind of data that, that we can have. And, and these are people who are not our customers. So imagine what we could do if you were a customer yep. and you actually let us put these vantage points inside of your infrastructure, yep. which is what a lot of enterprises do, and then how we can help correlate those experiences so that every single user is having a great experience. And what's the what's the application or the single pane of glass or what, what do you use to manage that? So we've integrated uh, Thousand Eyes yep. into all of our portfolios, Meraki, Catalyst, WebEx. Uh, we've gone and integrated it with AppD and, and we've done kind of the first level integration with Splunk, but there's a lot more that we're gonna be doing on that side. And of course, we've integrated it with security. So if you're an SSE customer of ours, then you automatically get Thousand Eyes deployed vantage point on your device. So what does this mean? This means that I can not only see the experience between you yep. and the SSC proxy, but beyond there. Yep. And so I know that you're having a good or bad experience, but I also know, is it between you? Is it your wireless yep. network? Is it the last mile from the service provider? Is it a hop in between? Is it the proxy? Or is it something else? Is it happened going inside of the AWS infrastructure, which is, very exciting because we actually are now getting data directly from AWS and we're able to see past that global load balancer. Yep. And so we can make a map of all your services and all your applications inside of AWS as we know the experience of those applications specifically by users or groups of users. And we could say if there is an issue with a load balancer yep. or with uh, an access control issue and correlate that all together in real time or near real time. You mentioned Meraki, but when we started, you said one of the three topics you mentioned in the keynote was Meraki and Catalyst, is that right? So can you talk more about that? Absolutely, so really excited. A year ago, we announced the Cisco Network and Cloud Platform. Yep. We made amazing progress. Yep. So what that means is you can now, from the Meraki dashboard, you can manage your Catalyst switches, you can manage your 
Catalyst wireless devices, access points as well. Uh, and that's a seamless experience. I get a report every Friday showing me how many more devices are being managed and it continues to go up to the right rapidly. So very excited about all of you out there who are, who are using that. It's a dramatic simplification for, for users. We also, one of the biggest requests we got a year ago was, hey, I've got Catalyst SD-WAN and I have Meraki SD-WAN. Yep. And they, they don't talk to each other. It's yep. not one fabric. So yep. it's one fabric now. You actually can now have those two fabrics talk to each other. So if you have an endpoint that's Meraki and you have an endpoint that's Catalyst SD-WAN, you can now have a single harmonious fabric between the two, which was a big ask. And so we got that knocked out as well. But expect to see more integrations. We've got phenomenal integrations around Thousand Eyes and also a whole new set of assurance capabilities in Meraki as well. But uh, swing by the booth or check out the demos and, and you'll see more. It's great to hear the announcements, and I believe there was an announcement last week that I missed uh, with Meraki as well. We did. So there's a great announcement between uh, Cisco and AT&T okay. about how we are simplifying the digital journey for actually buying a 5G gateway okay. for your Meraki deployments that could be at a home, at a branch, uh, retail location. And the one of the great things is now that you have eSIMs available on these Meraki gateways, AT&T is actually giving you 30 days of free connectivity. Oh, wow. So you can use that connectivity. You can do zero-touch provisioning, bring it up. Super easy to put together. And then you can decide to stay with AT&T or you can switch to another eSIM provider. But really happy with the partnership with AT&T and what we're doing and how easily they have made it to plug and play these new Meraki 5G gateways. Jonathan, I always bring it up. I don't know we laugh about it. You wrote a VoIP book many years ago and the world has moved... There've been a lot of iterations, right? And like you mentioned about AI, a lot of things people are scared of perhaps. I remember how VoIP changed the world. AI is changing the world at the moment. But looking back over the years, what would you say to your, your younger self? Yeah, well, I'll tell you this. Voice over IP is still illegal in a few countries. Oh, wow. Believe it or not. Yeah. Um, and so whenever you try to use legislation to stop innovation, usually that means that you get left behind. Yeah. So it's important to let it go. So for those, uh, for those people who are earlier in their career, go for it. You know, be afraid. Don't be afraid of learning. This is this is learning will be your forever role, yeah. and you know that's one of the things I love about it. And I think I don't think anybody really gets into technology if they don't love learning. Exactly. And if you are, you should probably switch to a different role yeah. because you're going to be learning for the rest of your life. And I love it. And I feel like that keeps that keeps us old guys young. But what I love about it as well, right, is because a lot of young people say, "Oh, I've got no experience." But I always advise, you know, if you jump on the next wave or the next important thing, you can jump far ahead because AI isn't that old for a lot of people. You know, so it's going to be working on it for a long time, but it's 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 changed the world only in the last few years. I mean, I really felt like I'm in networking because in 1995, 1994, 1993, that was new and yeah. it was exciting and it was innovative. And I remember the first dial-up router that yeah. we plugged in to connect to the internet and there were like two websites you could go to and it was very exciting. And, and there's a lot of new waves that are coming out. AI is one of them. Jonathan, thanks so much. I really appreciate you making the time talking to us. Thanks. Wonderful talking to you too.